Hello and welcome back to Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. Here's why you should tune in to today's show. There are rumors that Twitter is developing its own crypto wallet. We're going to get into that story and talk about why it matters. Plus, we'll explore the current state of crypto regulation with U.S. midterms around the elect uh, around the corner, and we're going to discuss its future with Kathy Craninger, former top U.S. consumer regulator. She will join us live. Stay tuned for that. My name is Mark Oliveira. Elaine Lai is with me today. How's it going, Elaine? What's going? What, how are you doing today? Marco, there is so much going on in the world right now, but not so much with the market prices. I'm getting used to the pain there, but just ongoing activity and people building and big players are reacting to stuff. Noise on crypto Twitter is so loud, but definitely is being heard. Yeah, definitely some big players reacting to stuff. We have some stories about that today. But first, we have a word from Rao. Things are tough out there. So to stay true to our mission to help investors, we have just reduced the price of a subscription to Real Vision Essential to $99 a year. And a subscription to the Plus tier is just $400 a year until the end of October. There's also a juicy discount on our pro crypto tier. Scan the QR code at the bottom or head over to realvision.com forward slash crash pricing to learn more. So with that said, let's jump into the latest price action. Bitcoin is up slightly. It's trading above 19,500. It hasn't gone above 20K for a few weeks now. So it will be interesting to see what happens when it breaks out of this current price range. That said, we're seeing the trade volume growing compared to other cryptocurrencies. According to Keiko data reported by Coindesk, Bitcoin's trade volume market share has hit the highest levels since 2020. Also, according to the report, the trend began in April when Terra and Luna imploded. And this suggests a bearish outlook for the rest of the crypto market. It. Anyway, that's Bitcoin. What about you, Elaine? How's Ethereum doing? Marco, straight into the green today. We're zooming into the 1400s. It's actually making a solid move on that front. So ETH is nearly up by 4% on a 24-hour basis. It's closing in on the 1400, as I said, the highest we've seen since September. Highest we've seen since September. That's good to hear. Well, let's take a look at our top news story for today. So here's a story that's got crypto Twitter buzzing. According to a well-placed source, Twitter is working on its own crypto wallet. Tell me, Elaine, what do we know so far about it? Not much at this point, if I'm honest. Look, the information comes from a Twitter account, and it's from the Twitter account Jane Manchin Wong. She is a front um, end engineer, and she says she doesn't work for Twitter. But what it is, is she's got a good track record of breaking tech <coughs> stories and revealing new developments at places like Twitter, Meta, and Airbnb. Here's what she tweeted. Twitter is working on a wallet prototype that supports crypto deposit and withdrawal. Twitter has not commented on that story. It obviously comes against the backdrop of Mr. Elon Musk potentially buying Twitter. He has until this Friday to finalize the transaction. Twitter itself has been dipping its toes into crypto, though. We know that the company has introduced NFT profile pictures. That's the profile pictures we, you see in the shape of a hexagon. But creating a wallet is a whole new level. Meta, the parent company of Facebook, failed. We'll see if Twitter can be more successful. Well, speaking of Twitter, Twitter is obviously super important to you, Elaine. I see you on there all the time tweeting like amazing tweets. What do you make of this personally? Marco, guilty as charged. Our very own team says I'm on Twitter more often than them, and they have more than 300,000 followers. Look, if you can incentivize the person who is giving you the great thread, right, or an excellent write-up, they should be directly awarded for it, just like when publishers have to publish an article, okay? This is a tweet that I regularly tweet out. Web 1 read. Web 2, read and write. Web 3, read, write and own. I think ownership of content is going to be so important for the next phase of the internet. And this could be the next big thing for Twitter if they get it right. And Reddit as another social platform. Look at them launching their own NFT collections. Why is that important? Well, that's because they managed to get a lot more people downloading a digital wallet. Now, we know Jack Dorsey loves blockchain technology, right? Twitter has also been hiring a DeFi team since last year that we've been heavily trying to pitch for. But we also know that he's working on a new social app, Blue Sky Social. There are apparently 30,000 signups already just to check out the beta mode, and it's meant to be a new decentralized social network. So a Twitter wallet being worked on is no surprise here. Yeah, some big things were going on at Twitter for sure. Well, as we speak about big tech, Apple has codified its rules for NFTs for the first time. It's fair to say that this has people talking. Elaine, what do you make of this? Can you break it down for us? 
Yeah, Marco, let me start by reading the relevant part of the developer guideline from Apple. And this is a, a lot of screen grabs that we're seeing on people's Twitter timeline at the moment. And it says apps may use in-app purchase to sell and sell services relating to non-fungible tokens, NFTs, such as minting, listing and transferring. So far, so good, right, Marco? But here's the bit that follows is more important. Apps may allow users to view their own NFTs, provided that NFT ownership does not unlock features or functionality within the app. The guideline also bans any methods to send users to third party websites in order to circumvent Apple's in-app purchase system. Now, why does this matter? Because Apple takes 30 uh, percent from in-app sales. So we effectively have a ban on NFT trading inside Apple apps. That's because Coindesk reports creators and market places prefer to remove that ability rather than pay so much to Apple. Very anti Web3 vibes here. Yeah, very anti Web3 <laughs> uh, Web vibes indeed. Elaine, I also heard that there's some revised guidance regarding exchanges. What do you make of it? Yeah, some lines coming out for that one as well. So apps belonging to um, exchanges can operate and they provided that they are offered only in countries or regions where the app has appropriate licensing and permission to provide a cryptocurrency exchange. The issues of relevant licensing keeps coming up and you see those massive crypto exchanges in every single one of these countries trying to iron out the, regu um, the regulation for those countries. So Apple has clarified the rules on that front. OK, well, let's move on to our next story. Britain has a new prime minister, and I know what you may be thinking. You're like, what? Didn't we just get a new prime minister a few weeks ago? And you are correct. This is the third prime minister in the UK, and it's only been a couple months. We're not going to get into that story. Instead, we're going to talk about why you should care, especially if you don't live in the UK. And fortunately, we have a resident Brit on the crypto team. It's none other than Miss Paper Handed Princess herself. Elaine, fill us in. Why should we care about this? Oi, who managed to put that one in there? Look, the reason why people should care is because Rishi Sunak, the new British Prime Minister, is a crypto bull. Here's a short clip from an interview. Take a look. Bored apes or crypto punks? Bored apes. Um, Bitcoin or Ethereum? Oh, I, I do basket of cryptocurrency. That's a safe answer. Yeah. Uh, all right, don't think too many world leaders would answer those questions. For a little bit of context, though, Sunak was the finance minister, sort of like the U.S. Treasury Secretary in the U.S., who rose to prominence during the pandemic. Before that, he worked as a hedge fund manager at the investment bank Goldman Sachs. So Sunak wants to turn to the U.K., turn the UK into a crypto hub. He's also keen on creating a British CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. All of that will likely not be a priority for Sunak in the near term, and given the difficult economic situation in the UK. But if he sticks around for longer than his predecessor, fingers crossed at that one, we could soon see the UK make some waves in the crypto space, a much more friendly environment towards crypto as a whole. Yeah, fingers crossed that he sticks around. Well, for the last piece of news for the day, uh, this one's a pretty wild story coming from Coindesk. The U.S. Department of Justice has revealed that two Chinese intelligence officers have been charged with obstruction of justice for allegedly trying to bribe a U.S. government official with $61,000 in Bitcoin. They're accused <laughs> of trying to collect information about a prosecution of an unnamed company, which appears to be uh, Huawei Technologies, a Shenzhen-based multinational tech company. Apparently, one of the defendants referred to Bitcoin as a quote unquote safe method of paying a law enforcement official. And they even suggested going to a gambling house in Las Vegas to convert the Bitcoin to cash. While the amount of Bitcoin was not a lot, U.S. officials feel that this action is a part of a broader effort by the Chinese government to undermine international laws and individual rights. Anyways, that's it for today's stories. On to our main interview. Let's bring in our guest, Kathy Kraninger. She's a former director of the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and now vice president of regulatory affairs at Solidus Labs. Kathy, welcome to the show. We appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you and your audience. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Elaine, feel free to take it away. I'll be back with key takeaways after your interview. Thank you, Marco. All right, lots to get through, but I think I've brought it down to a few. Now, Kathy, I know that we've had the Biden administration signing an executive order, which somewhat supports cryptocurrencies, and now we're seeing a bit of power control in DC of who should do what. So I think first and foremost, I want to start by asking you, let's just start on uh, your thoughts on crypto regulation right now here in the US. 
No, it's a it's a broad question, Elaine, but to your point, there's never a dull moment in this space, and there are a lot of different players. Um, some like to call it the alphabet soup of agencies, and there is no doubt that is true. But really, the the players who are getting the most attention in the crypto space, and it's really because of who will actually ultimately oversee the spot markets in crypto, is really the SEC and the CFTC. And from their vantage point, it's really looking at their current authorities right now. You know, what can they do? And you see uh, a focus on enforcement. So uh, Chair Benham at the CFTC is highlighting their fiscal year enforcement stats and talking about uh, a quite a bit of crypto enforcement activity. And at the SEC, Chairman Gensler is highlighting uh, similar things, uh, frankly. He believes that he has the authority he needs and that entities should register with the SEC, uh, whether as um, exchanges um, through what um, is, you know, again, the typical regulatory structure there or as broker dealers. Um, and so that that activity is is his push. And then, of course, you have the crypto industry saying, wait a minute, some of those rules really just don't make sense uh, for what we're doing here. And, and even if we wanted to comply, and while we don't think we're actually um, listing or issuing securities, um, you know, there are complications and issues there. Uh, I was speaking a little bit earlier with uh, several U.S. regulators and yesterday at an event about what it would take to actually put um, a, a, a security, take a security or a tokenized security and put it on the blockchain. And you cannot really do that uh, under current rules. You have to use an existing exchange. You have to use all the existing intermediaries, which just add cost and inefficiency um, to all of the ability of the blockchain to settle and clear right in the speed of light. Uh, that that whole speed of movement there is is one of the benefits of this system, and it takes a lot of cost out. But you've got a lot of cost in the current system. Uh, so then you go to Congress, uh, and I know we want to talk about uh, what what can alter the current trajectory of these agencies looking at their current authority, and that's Congress acting. Um, so a lot of lot of exciting things around uh, elections upcoming and who might be in the seats and what the um, you know what their priorities look like for next year. Yeah, well, that brings me to my very next question. I feel like everyone just needs to hold hands like all in the straight line and just keep moving forward inch by inch. Um, look, Kathy, I wanted to ask you, do you think crypto voters can influence the U.S. midterm elections and are U.S. Uh, candidates positioning themselves correctly and accordingly? So uh, I can tell you they absolutely are. Uh, certainly compared to prior elections, you have a couple of things going on. One uh, the engagement by uh, crypto players in Washington in general, uh, understanding that they need to be part of the process if they want to influence the process. And so it is something you see. Uh, it is amazing to me uh, the, the number of even uh, those in Web3 and DeFi who are talking about regulation and talking about what it should look like and understanding better what the barriers are to them launching their project or their business. And so that engagement is extensive. Uh, you see it in the in the um, Discord channels and otherwise there's a lot of conversation about what it should look like. So that's positive. Um, and and every year, frankly, let's be honest, uh, the those who are being elected to office are younger and younger uh, as well they should be. And so you see that transition of power that that is natural progression, younger people coming into play. And you see it with the electorate as well. Uh, recent uh, poll that was done of voters, you have really 17% of the voters in the U.S. actually own crypto and 44% own it or are considering it or actually looking at it. And the bulk of those are, you know, younger people, as well as a third of them being people of color. So you have to pay attention to these growing dynamics that are not falling along traditional party lines. Uh, and so you see Republican and Democrat candidates, Republican and Democrat members of Congress who are paying attention to this growing base of you know, their constituents and the potential for the future of finance, the future of so many other things that the blockchain could be useful for. Um, you know, they're starting to grapple with it. And, and again, younger people uh, understanding 
you know, what that looks like. Uh, I can't say it's been pivotal to any particular race. I think there are a few uh, maybe known skeptics who there was a hope that they might be overthrown in a, in a primary or two, um, and that did not happen. <clears throat> but every little bit really does help. And you look at some of the races like in the state of Ohio, where I'm from, you know, you have members who are very uh, pro uh, crypto are really thinking about this. And it is a conversation, you know, in uh, the race and therefore amongst the electorate and getting attention in the media, you know, like with conversations like this as well. So all of that helps. Yeah, it's fascinating just to watch like a whole new generation just really, again, taking people who are interested and need to push what they stand for along. It, it's really nice to actually see people come out. And I know many young founders in the space are actually spending whatever they have to do in their 40 to 50 endless hours in DeFi and crypto, but also taking, you know, a good healthy few hours into the day, really ironing out these regulation policies that exist in our framework right now. Um, okay, so I think, Kathy, I want to ask you, what is the the one single most pressing regulation policy right now in the US to really drive institutional backing um, and for mass adoption? No, I think uh, it, it's one of those things that is, um, frankly, pretty challenging to grapple with. It's, it's how should Congress tackle this entire arena? And from my vantage point, it's whatever mm. piece of it they will actually take and move. Because right you know, getting those mechanics to actually move, uh, getting to consensus around one topic is key. And so while I don't think it's the, you know, most pivotal piece of regulation that needs to get done or the most pivotal law that needs to change, I do think the stablecoin legislation, uh, while I don't think it's going to happen this year, that is a, a really, uh, by most accounts, kind of the first leading thing that everyone should and could settle on that would make a big difference for the infrastructure of the ecosystem. And then you go from there. So I think uh, institutions are really just looking for clarity around how can they get engaged with this space? What does it mean? Um, and so from that standpoint, two things like accounting rules and tax rules matter. So you see things happening uh, in the IRS and in the international standards around accounting. But I think Congress acting and acting in an area of crypto policy is really what everyone is looking for and waiting for that's going to start turning the tide, that's going to say, hey, we can actually address these issues on a bipartisan basis. We can come forward with things that are going to just provide greater clarity. Um, and so it's the first step, uh, in my opinion, that's the most important one. And stablecoins seem to be really where, um, at least generally, people are concerned about the risks that are there. Um, they play, again, a key role in the infrastructure and in, in how we get to interoperability amongst different projects in DeFi, how we think about bridges, how we think about uh, be able, really being able to exchange value. And you get to where uh, a lot of people, if they understand you know, what a stable coin truly means and that it is in fact stable, and we can get better definitions there, um, particularly those that are asset backed <clears throat> and, and clearly you know, dollar, dollarized uh, stable coins, that, that consumers will better understand also how they engage in the ecosystem and what is a safer product uh, for them uh, to engage with. That's what I think will will help. And now it, yeah. it's, it's it's definitely fraught. There are some real issues around the stablecoin bill, which is why you know it hasn't moved forward. Um, mm. What a CBDC yeah. would mean, you know, what what um, you know, it, can non banks issue a stablecoin? You know, so those those are the things that are being grappled with. Yeah, no, it, it really reminds me just, you know, when it comes to pushing policy over the finishing line in the world's biggest democracy, even each state sort of functions like its own country. You know, it's it's such a, a piece of hard work, but it's interesting to listen to you. Like if you see a little piece of policy that you see on the amber light, hopefully the industry leaders, the policymakers can really just keep a hold of, of that one in the amber light and, and push it through. Um, I know you touched a little bit about stable coins. That's why I wanted to to jump in. So do you and I think with if the if the if the US does issue 
um, you know, uh, the US Treasury does issue a, a digital currency. It's sort of like a general consensus then. That has a base that someone can move forward to. So do you do you think we'll see a, a US CBDC? I know it's not soon, but what does your gut say about that will happen? I personally do think it will happen, but I think there is so much around what does that look like? And I think the the stablecoin legislation is definitely tied to that because it's fundamentally what's the role of the private sector and what's the role of the government, specifically the Fed. Um, our system is generally where the, the Fed is involved is wholesale. You know, you don't have a bank account personally as a consumer, you know, with the Federal Reserve. So it's really about the system of how banks interchange and how they interact with each other, which pushes that to a different place. The CBDCs in a lot of other countries are in fact retail. You look at the sand dollar in the Bahamas, you look at the conversation even that's happening in the EU, in the EU you know, there is some idea here that those are going to be, you know, in people's personal wallets, so to speak. Um, that is a, a discussion and debate that is uh, really uh, challenging in the U.S. I, I think there is a lot of concern really, again, about privacy there and what the government's insight then into every transaction that you engage in in your life, you know, it, that's something that uh, historically has been a huge concern for Americans. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, I think, where some of the rub comes. I think there are some fantastic pilots happening around how we can do this, uh, what should be done. And so I think, you know, that's, that's a continuing conversation. It's going to take time. Uh, but I do think it will happen. Part of it then you get to is the national security uh, dimension of this. The U.S. needs to remain prominent in this marketplace. This needs to be the place that that people want to launch projects. This needs to be the place where we embed the values of our society into our currency. And so I would say to everybody in this space who I know is paying attention to this debate, um, that's fantastic and truly important. I agree completely with my friend Chris Giancarlo about this. This is our money. This is our country. And we need to engage in this process and frame exactly what it should look like. Yeah, let me ask you this then, Kathy. You know, you do see American citizens, you know, setting up their companies in the Bahamas, taking off American soil. So what are the ramifications if, you know, we can't get the balance between regulation and entrepreneurial just you know, tangoing together, what does that mean for the U.S. in sort of the regulation space uh, of being a leader in, in that front? No, it, it is a concern. And that is why I applauded, you know, the president's executive order, too, because at least what it laid out was very clearly what the goals of the country need to be around this topic. And, you know, I don't like thinking about balances because I, I like to think we can have it all in these in these kind of policy uh, trade-offs, but there, but there are trade-offs here. And so mm. it's something that we need to understand and be thoughtful about building. And loss of, of U.S. predominance in tech is a huge problem. You think about how the internet grew and was established, it was very much with those freedoms embedded. And, and we, we have continued challenges, I know, is how we think about how technology should be uh, regulated as well. But but we don't want to go down uh, a state controlled route um, because, you know, again, that look at what's going on in China, too. There, there are some uh, real threats and concerns if the U.S. doesn't maintain its role and, and really embed democratic values into these things. Mm. Uh, Kathy, I want to move on to consumer protection next, which I know is definitely your field. So how do you think we're doing with uh, consumer protection within the U.S.? Is it too much, too little or just enough? Where, what's the current state of crypto right now with consumer protection? No, I think the industry needs to do more uh, from my perspective, and it's a continued education effort. Uh, so so that's one thing. There is a role for the industry. It, it is not just a free for all that we rely on the government to do this. We've got to call out fraud. We've got to point out bad, you know, again, those that are seeking to um, uh, defraud consumers. And you saw some people did. I mean, there, there definitely were those conversations out there before the Terra Luna collapse. Uh, where people were saying, look, understand the way this operates. We need better disclosures. So that's that's on the industry. Um, it's also on the um, enforcement agencies and the regulators because they've been hesitant, I think, to step in on some of those things earlier. And, and we're going to see that, um, that continue and, and push. 
um, on their front. So I think that's important. That includes at the state level. You certainly talked, uh, Elaine, about the fact that we do have state regulators, but we've got state attorneys general. Fraud is illegal uh, and they should go after it and definitely um, continue to help inform consumers about where we need to go. I think the last thing, though, is so many of our disclosures are antiquated. That's true in traditional finance. That's true in crypto. If you're just, you know, again, following the letter of the law, how do we better assess those consumers who are, you know, more sophisticated, less sophisticated, and really give them the information they need to make the best decisions for themselves? That's a fundamental of consumer protection. That helps you prevent being, you know, the victim of fraud. Because even if the enforcement agency comes in after the fact, it's going to be years before you see any uh, any of your money come back to you. So what you want to do mm-hmm. is prevent it. Hopefully, enforcement also uh, takes some of those really low-level fraudsters out of that market. Um, but they're going to continue to be with us. And so prevention is really the best thing to do. Okay. Um, thank you, Kathy. These are such uh, incredible insights with every different branch of the government's talking about that. So I did a bit of research. I remember picking up from a podcast that you said enforcement was one of your greatest assets. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it really is that ability to come in uh, and after the fact and lay out bad behavior and and call it out and try to keep markets clean and transparent. So it is it is an essential tool. Uh, it's not the only tool. And, and that's why I also have to talk about prevention and some of the things around education, because I think there's a balance there. Uh, it definitely is important to police those markets and to call out bad behavior and to prosecute it. Um, but at the same time, as I said, the, the front end of this is important too. And that's really trying to help consumers stay out of that fraudster's net to begin with. Um, so, so good, good uh, balance there of the activity that's happening, but but essential to have all the tools at your disposal as a regulator. No, that's great, uh, Kathy. I remember speaking to one of your colleagues before, and he said there's one thing that stuck in my head actually, where he says complexity is risk itself. So we really need to spearhead uh, the education front. I'm going to bring Marco back in. Marco, did you enjoy a bit of that conversation that just happened? Yeah, it was great. Uh, you guys b- both talked about a lot, including CBDCs, mass adoption, enforcement, enforcement, prote- uh, prevention, among other topics. But here are my key takeaways. Kathy discussed the current state of crypto regulation. The players getting the most attention right now are the SEC and the F- CFTC. Uh, but the crypto industry is pushing back on the rules that are being laid out. So while there's a lot of uncertainty of who's going to take the reins or what's going to come next, the one thing that we're that everyone's looking at is Congress. They're looking for them to act, especially for things like stable coins interoperability, among other things. The second thing that stood out was the way that you guys discussed the midterm ele- midterm elections and how midterms and, and crypto affect each other. Uh, you guys reference a poll every year that, uh, you know, the or the recent poll of voters uh, owning 17% of crypto and 44% own it or are considering that it, a bulk of them are younger and they're people of color. And this is a growing uh, base of constituents getting attention. Uh, and so this is kind of, you know, important for politicians on both of the sides uh, to pay attention to. And and the third thing that you guys discuss is the national security element. It's important for the U.S. to remain a world leader for this innovation. And if you see what's happening in China right now, uh, you can see that there's some real threats if the U.S. doesn't stay at the forefront. And on that point, we have to also remember that lots of the U.S. predominance in tech was because of the freedom to build. And it's important that regulators remember that when it comes to crypto. Anyways, those are the three things that stood out to me the most. But what about you, uh, Elaine and Kathy? Anything to add there? Marco, I, I think you kill it with the the takeaways. I think on on my front, it's just it's no secret that people are, are frustrated from the entrepreneurial side or people working within government. But the thing is, it, crypto regulation has to come to us quick. It's very noisy, but we have to get it right in order to prevent really bad stuff from happening later on down further in the line in the future. And it was just wonderful to have Kathy on the show too, you know, where she's been in the unique position of being on both sides. So that was really interesting. Um, to hear from Kathy. Sorry, Kathy, what did you want to say? No, I was going to agree with you completely. I, I think you, you killed the summary for sure. Um, but the, the level of discourse in general is, is important, even though it's hard for those that don't follow Washington to understand exactly which thing they should pay attention to. So hopefully this was helpful from that standpoint too. 
Perfect. Well, we have uh, some viewer questions that came in. It looks like we have one from King Kobe's on our Discord server. Uh, so he said, so much activity, and yet how many steps are there before either SEC or CFTC or a new regulator is in place? Honestly, so much activity, so little progress. What are your thoughts on this, Kathy? Now, I, I can sympathize. I understand. Again, it shouldn't be the responsibility of a developer to understand the alphabet soup that they need to actually you know, get into. So it's it's trying to boil that down uh, for them. I, um, I, I would love to see a safe harbor established. I've, I've been on the record around this so that that developer really can focus on the project, understand just, again, basic risks and considerations, um, basic disclosures and move forward. Uh, rather than having to start from, you know, classifying it as a security as, or, or a commodity and doing all the registration work that needs to happen before they're even off the ground. Um, so those are the kinds of things that it would be fantastic to see. Unfortunately, that's not, you know, that's not where we are. So you do have to worry about uh, what uh, enforcement actions perhaps might come down the pike that, that could affect you at this stage of the game. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll boil away to the same point that we made earlier, which is uh, really looking for congressional leadership here and and some uh, framing out uh, in the law. Yes, congress congressional leadership indeed. Uh, we have another question from Goldmember. This one's for Elaine. It's a question on NFTs. What are your thoughts on the Reddit NFT craze? What do you make of Reddit marketing NFTs as digital collectibles? Oh, no, the DGENs have pierced their way into the Crypto Daily briefing show, Marco. I think to me, Reddit, there's a lot of them that was released, various links, various projects. So I actually think they released at a time where so many other things are still in pushing out there. What I do find is fascinating, though, that I think however million wallets that people managed to download for their collection was the same amount that Coinbase managed to do so far. Obviously, Coinbase NFT has not worked out the way that it's wanted to. So it'll be fascinating to see how with this um, NFT collection and onboarding of people into the whole Reddit NFT community, it'll be great to see how this one plays out. But definitely. Definitely, I think def, uh, one that has been released and a very busy time of the week for NFTs. So I myself need to go back and have a look at the, is it the spooky season one that I need to get? Or there's a polygon uh, bit that I need to work out. So I definitely need to step away from this show and get back on my DJ moves. Back in the DJ moves. Okay, well, perfect. That was that was great uh, for the viewer questions. I appreciate you both coming on to the show and having this discussion. It was a really insightful discussion. Uh, that's it for today. Don't forget to subscribe. Real Vision Crypto is free. We also have some paid content. If you're looking for professional grade crypto research, scan the QR code on the screen to find out more. For those watching on YouTube, smash everything, the like button, the bell, and subscribe. Tomorrow, we've got Crypto Weatherman with the latest technical analysis. You don't want to miss it. See you tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern, live on Real Vision Crypto Daily Briefing. Oh.